In this section, we're going to talk about modern evolutionary classification and how it has changed from Linnaeus' classification. So get your papers ready. Organisms are the ones who determine what their species are by choosing with whom they're going to mate. So all of the other taxonomic groups above species have been invented by biologists to help them group organizations and study characteristics. Linnaeus and other taxonomists always used, always used biologically important characteristics, but even that had problems and limitations. So let's take a look at how classification has changed since Linnaeus' time in the 1700s. Get your papers ready, wide right, skinny left, and I'll see you on the next slide. How would you classify this animal if you lived in Linnaeus' time? Is it a fish or a mammal? It has characteristics similar to a fish, kind of looks like a fish, it lives in water. But it has lungs and it feeds its young with milk that the mother produces. Kind of puzzling. What about these three? The one on the left is a limpet, the one in the middle is a barnacle, and the one on the right is a crab. Would you put the limpet and the barnacle together because they have shells that look similar? And where does the crab fit in here? It doesn't look like either one of those two. Linnaeus based his classification system on visible similarities and differences. But his problem was in determining just which characteristics were the most important. Biologists didn't always agree. So as we learn more and more, biologists began to suspect that there was another part to this puzzle and we're going to talk about that in this section. In the mid to late 1800s, Charles Darwin came up with the idea of descent with modification. What he said was, each living species has descended or evolved with changes from other related species over long, long periods of time. One example that made him come up with the, this idea was what he observed in the different species of finches in the Galapagos Islands off the coast of South America. If you take a look at the beaks and the diets of each of these finches shown here, you can see what led him to think that. On the left hand side you see the tree finches and on the right hand side the ground finches. Two very different species but with many different, I'm sorry, two very different genuses or genera, but with many different beaks suited to the type of food that they ate. Over thousands of years the climate on the islands changed, therefore the food supplies changed. So the birds changed so that they could eat the available food. Natural selection allows organisms with new or variations on existing characteristics to flourish in environments where their ancestors probably perished. Because of this, organisms today look very different from their ancestors. However, when organisms are rearranged based on evolutionary trends rather than physical traits, some of Linnaeus's work falls apart. All of this has led biologists to study not just the physical characteristics of an organism, but its phylogeny or evolutionary relationships to classify it. Phylogenetic systematics, or evolutionary classification, shows lines of descent rather than similarities and differences in their characteristics. One term that you will hear often as we talk about phylogeny is clade. A clade is a group of species with a common ancestor and all descendants, living and extinct. So on a biological diagram called a cladogram, Birds and reptiles are in the same clade. More on that in a bit. One important distinction of phylogeny, however, is the concept of common ancestors. Species in the same genus are closely related to one another and share a recent common ancestor. The larger the taxa, or group, the further back in time is the shared ancestor. This is where some of Linnaeus's classifications fall apart. Modern birds look nothing like reptiles, 
yet they share some common characteristics with reptiles, and so birds are reptiles, at least when you consider them through the phylogenetic systematics. Let's look at that further. Okay, so a little grammar lesson here. When you learn about, when we learn all these various terms in biology, it's often helpful to know the, the roots or the, um, the origins of all these terms because it kind of helps you remember it. Cladogram comes from the Greek word klados, meaning branch, and gramma, meaning something written or drawn. So as we learn more about cladograms, you're going to see how this name fits really well. A cladogram links groups of organisms that are related by evolutionary trends rather than just simply physical traits. Biologists study the when and the how that that trait appeared to cause that species to branch off. So it shows evolutionary lines. The term node is used to refer to the base of the branch. And you see a node here where there's vertebrae just below the node. And nodes go all the way up to here where we see hair and eggs with a shell. Nodes are important because they show the last point of shared ancestry for the organisms above that node. The trait or ancestor at the very bottom of the cladogram is shared by all organisms in that cladogram. So as we look at this cladogram here, you can see that, okay, all of the organisms have vertebrae, but which organisms have just four limbs? Amphibians, primates, rodents and rabbits, crocodiles and birds, because they come after that on the cladogram. Which organisms have hair? So you kind of get the idea on how to read a cladogram. Linnaeus focused on observable traits to classify organisms. Cladistic analysis is more precise. It focuses on derived characters or traits that arose in the most common ancestor. Studying the cladogram to the right, we find derived characters such as hair, carnivorous teeth, and retractable claws. All of these are observable traits, yes, but today's biologist considers when and where those traits appeared in evolutionary time. If you study this diagram, you can tell what traits are derived characters for which clade. For example, four limbs is a derived character for the entire tetrapodoclade. Hair is a derived character for the clade mammalia, but four legs is not. Can you see why? Because four legs comes before even amphibians. So it's the, the trait is only for that clade. Which clade is sharp teeth a derived character for? Carnivora? We've talked about how four limbs is a derived character for tetrapoda. And according to the diagram, reptiles are in the class in the clade tetrapoda. But snakes don't have four limbs. However, ancestors of snakes did have four limbs. Somewhere, that trait was lost. For this reason, biologists are cautious about using the absence of trait as a character in their analysis. Whales don't have four limbs either. But snakes are certainly more closely related to reptiles than they are to whales. As you see in this diagram, too, you can also have smaller clades within the larger clades as you go from tetrapoda to animalia to mammalia. Now, you're probably wondering why I said such an outlandish thing as birds are put with reptiles in a clade. Here's why. One way to understand if you're looking at a clade is to use what we call the SNP test. If you SNP above a node, the part that falls off is a clade. Okay, So if I SNP above a node, where it falls off, that's a clade. So 
If I clip where this red line appeared in that middle diagram where it says clade reptilia, I clip right above that node where it branched off, I get turtles, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, and birds because all of those organisms share similar characteristics at, say, at similar times. I have what I call the clade reptilia. If I clip here on the bottom diagram, just above that node, I have the clade aves, which is birds, that can be studied. But if you look at the top diagram, there is no clade for reptilia only. The top excuse me, the top diagram shows the class reptilia. I can't snip off that clade and also snip off birds. It, it can't happen. I can't snip anywhere and not include birds. This is why biologists now include birds with reptiles when they're studying fossils. Birds descended from the same ancestor and so they must be a part of that clade. As we saw on the last diagram, smaller clades can exist within larger clades. So the clade aves exists within the clade reptilia which exists within the clade chordata. The closer two organisms are on a clade or the more shared traits they have, the more closely related those two organisms are. And as we've seen, Cladistic analysis does not always agree with traditional Linnaean classification. But the most important thing to consider when we look at a cladogram are the links between the groups and how they're related to each other. Linnaeus never even thought of that question because Darwin hadn't done his work at that time. So Linnaeus did the best he could, which really was pretty good, I think. DNA. Remember what that is? It's a nucleic acid. Remember what nucleic acids are? Carbon compound that contains carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And it's responsible for the transmission of genetic information from one generation to the next. DNA, we've known about it for quite some time, but the ability to isolate it and compare it to the DNA of uh, of one or the DNA of one organism to the DNA of another organism is really very new. And remember, the DNA of one species is unique to that species. No other species has that DNA sequence. That's important. Classification methods have relied primarily on physical characteristics, similarities, and differences until very recently. With the advent of DNA testing, Besides determining who's the daddy on all these talk shows in the afternoon, DNA testing has been invaluable in helping biologists to determine evolutionary relationships. One example is these three birds, the African vulture on the left, the American vulture all the way over on the right, and the stork in the middle. The African and American vultures have similar physical characteristics, if you take a look at them. They both have a bald head, they both have a hooked beak, they have similar eating habits. You would think they're closely related. However, the American vulture has a strange habit. When it gets overheated, it pees or urinates on its leg. As the pee evaporates, it removes body heat. Think back to our Water, water properties. Remember why? When water evaporates, it needs heat. So when it evaporates off your skin, it cools you down. Storks also have this odd behavior. But since storks live in a very different habitat from vultures, biologists were curious about how this behavior could be found in both species. DNA testing on all three birds showed biologists that the American vulture is more closely related to storks since their DNA sequence is more similar to, than the African and American vultures. So the stork and the American vulture, their DNA is more similar than the African and American vultures. So that means the stork and the American vulture are more closely related. Biologists had some reclassification to do, and this is just one example. 
we also talked about the red panda and the giant panda. that's another one.